One of the most controversial subjects among most Christians are the holy days of Leviticus chapter 23. Many churches do keep the holy days, but most don't. And most churches teach that the law of God is done away. It was nailed to the cross. They teach the holy days and the Sabbath were not obligatory upon New Testament Christians. Many churches teach that the laws of clean and unclean meats were done away, so you can eat pork and snails, anything that crawls or swims in the ocean, and it doesn't matter. But in the first chapter of Genesis, there's a very clear-cut description of the creation of the world as it exists today, hospitable for man. Without the large dinosaurs, it would make it dangerous for man to live. And God used a six-day period. That was the length of time that God used in order to create a completely balanced environment that would be suitable for mankind. But notice what happened on the very seventh day of that creation week. Now, I'll read it out of the King James Version. This is Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Now the word sanctified denotes setting apart for holy use. And it goes on and say, it says why he set it apart. Because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So God ceased his work. But the seventh day became a memorial of the very rest of God and denoting the creativity which God had engaged in the previous six days. Now what does this have to do with the holy days? What does this have to do as determining whether the holy days even exist anymore, whether New Testament Christians should observe them? It has a great deal to do with it, because in verse 14 of the very creation week, we're going to see something very interesting. So the question becomes, did God, so construct, when he reconstructed the earth's atmosphere and made it suitable for man, did he construct the movement of the sun and of the moon for the expected keeping of the annual holy days all the way back from the beginning of creation? And if so, if the holy days of Leviticus 23 were intended all the way back in the very creation week, who gives the authority when it can't be found anywhere in Scripture, to cease observing them. Genesis 1, verse 14, indicates that God created the exact movement of the sun and the moon for the keeping of the festival from the beginning, not just when, the, when Israel came out of Egypt and was given the days of unleavened bread and the Passover. While there is no recorded evidence, and this is admitted, there is no recorded evidence that the holy days were kept prior to the time that they were given to Israel in the land of Egypt, why would God inspire the passage mentioned in Genesis 1.14 unless God actually intended people to keep them from the beginning? And possibly they were kept from the beginning. And I think it can be proved by Scripture they were kept. But as generations grew, and they, they grew worse and they drifted away from God, and we saw in Genesis, the sixth chapter, how everyone in the world had corrupted God's ways and he had turned to his own personal ways and had stopped obeying God. Then suddenly there was no rec recording of anyone obeying God. Anyone except one man, Noah. And then later on, we see Abraham came on the scene. But there is something very interesting about Abraham, and I don't think we can overlook it. Because the first few chapters of the book of Genesis is a very concise summary of what happened. It doesn't go into any details. There are no details, practically, as to what happened the first 14 or 1,500 years after God created the earth, up until the time of the flood. We just don't know what was going on at that period of time. And yet, in Genesis chapter 26, verse 5, I think we can absolutely prove that Abraham kept the holy days, and yet it doesn't even mention the holy days, and yet it does. Let's look and see how that could occur. Genesis 26, verse 5, it states very clearly that Abraham obeyed my voice, and this is God speaking, and kept my charge, my commandments, 
my statutes and my laws. It was because Abraham kept God's ways that he was promised great blessings to come upon him and his descendants through Jesus Christ, the one seed. But notice in Genesis 26, verse 5, it mentions that Abraham kept God's statutes. And they're God's. And how do we know what a statute is? Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23, and this is where the holy days are listed. Let's pick up in verse 14. And, and starting in verse 1, though, it's talking about the Sabbath. In verse 2, these are my, or verse 3, these are the feasts of the Lord. They're God's feasts, not Moses' feasts, not Israel's feasts, but they're God's feasts. And then it describes the Passover. It describes the days of unleavened bread. And then in verse 14, the very last sentence, about two-thirds of the way through the verse, it says, It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. The holy days were a statute of God. And it stated very clearly that Abraham obeyed God's statutes. Also, drop down in verse 21. After listing some more holy days, it says in the latter part, It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. And the generations of the Israelites have never ceased to exist as yet. And this statute, if it is the same that Abraham kept, it is one of the reasons why the promises were made to Abraham. But let's see what Genesis 1 verse 14 actually says. Let's go into it. Genesis 1, verse 14, this is the King James Version. And God said, Let there be light in the firmament, firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now, if you want to find out what something means in the original language before it's translated into the English language, you have to go back to that language and get its definition. The Strong's Concordance of the Hebrew-Greek languages gives the following meaning for the word seasons in Genesis 1, verse 14. It means an appointment, a fixed time, specifically a festival. Now that is what it means in the first chapter of Genesis, verse 14, for the word season. Conventionally, a year, by implication, an assembly as convened for a definite purpose. Straight out of Strong's Concordance for the meaning of the word season. So it says specifically a festival. So the word is derived from the Hebrew word Y-A-A-D, which means to fix upon by agreement or appointment, by implication to meet. And when do you meet together? Look in Leviticus chapter 23 and you see every time there's a holy day mentioned or the starting of it, this says, these are my holy convocation, a holy meeting, a coming together, a convening together to worship God and to hear his law proclaimed. And so the word in which this is derived from, the word season, Y-A-A-D means by implication to meet at a stated time, to summon so the actual and correct translation of the word season in Genesis 1.14 should have been festival. So it should have read in the, strong, in the King James language that we should come together and God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the days from the night and let them be for signs and for festivals. And that's all the way back in Genesis 1, verse 14. But now, let's not consider just this one verse in the King James language alone. Let's look at other translations and see if, the, if this word is actual seasons or if it should be festivals. In the New English Bible, the New English Bible, it reads like this, Genesis 1, verse 14. God said, Let there be lights in the vault of heaven to separate day from night, and let them serve for signs both for festivals and for seasons and years. New English translation. Let them also shine in the vault of heaven to give light on earth. 
So it was God made the two great lights, the greater to govern the day and the lesser to govern the night. But notice it was two great lights, and this is what we should be concerned with. Now, the Jerusalem Bible translation reads like this. God said, Let there be lights in the vault of heaven to divide day from night, and let them indicate festivals, days, and years. So once again, the proper translation has been used, indicate festivals, because without the moon and without the sun in proper conjunction, and if God has indicated a certain time when they're to be kept, if you don't know how to put the moon and sun in proper conjunction, you can't determine when to keep the festivals. The Good News Bible reads like this, Genesis 1, verse 14. Then God commanded, let lights appear in the sky to separate day from night and to show the time when days, years, and religious festivals begin. Very interesting. And then this, is com this comes from the Pentateuch, Samuel R. Hirsch, New York, 1963. This is verse 14. God said, let there be a system of light bearers in the vault of the heaven to distinguish between the day and the night, and they shall also serve for signs and for festival times and for cycles of days and years. So from these four translations, we see that in each case, they knew that the word season should be rendered festivals. Also, the Barishish on Genesis, in 1977, it reads like this. God said, Let there be luminaries in the firmament of the heaven to separate between the day and the night, and they shall serve as signs and for festivals and for days and years. So once again, festivals is used because that is what the actual Hebrew word means. The Living Torah, 1981 edition, reads like this. God said, There will be lights in the heavenly sky to divide between the day and the night. They shall serve as omens and define festivals. And how do you define festivals? By the sun and the moon. That's how you determine when the festivals are kept. Both the sun and moon. And the last quote is going to actually be from a commentary, uh, an article called The Calendar of Ancient Israel by Solomon Gans. I'll break into some of the thought. All right, we read there in verse 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them serve as signs for the festivals, the days and the years. End of quote. But then he goes on and makes this comment. The significance of this verse for the history of the calendar cannot be overlooked. We find here clearly the instruction that both, both luminaries, that the sun and the moon, are equal partners in the regulation of the calendar. We find here the establishment of a corrigency and condominium of both sun and moon over the calendar. So they both regulate the calendar not as the modern-day Jewish calendar. It's only regulated by the sun. We have to go by the moon and the sun, both in conjunction. And the final sentence in this particular quote, both luminaries, sun and moon, are to have their share in the determination of the festivals and the years. So both of them. And so I believe that the modern-day Jewish calendar is incorrect because of this. But now, let's go back. I think we can see from Genesis 26, verse 5, that Abraham kept the statutes of God. When we looked in Leviticus 23, we saw that actually God called them statutes forever. As long as there was an Israelite alive, they were to be, these feast days were to be kept. It was to be kept in their generations. And one generation would die, another one would be raised up. So as long as there are Israelites, these were to be kept. And many people try to stop them with the destruction of the temple. But I don't believe they can be stopped, because it says forever. And you and I individually can determine when the feast days are to be kept by the sun and the moon. But let's go back, and let's see if Israel kept the festivals. I don't believe that any Bible reader or any Bible scholar, if they want to put themselves in that category, 
will deny that ancient Israel was chosen of God, that they were actually God's chosen people, and that God gave his laws, his statutes, his judgments to them, and he recorded them in what we call the Old Testament. And most people refer to it as the Old Covenant. And he, they were considered an actual nation under God because it was God's laws that were ruling them. I don't believe anybody denies that. But after God had delivered Israel from slavery at the hands of the Egyptians, he finally brought them to the foot of Mount Sinai. And this is where the Old Covenant was ratified with the people. So let's take a look at that. Uh, Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant... Then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak unto the children of Israel. So God told Moses to say this to Israel. They were, they were to create a covenant, God and the children of Israel. Then look at verse 8, though. So the agreement was made. All God required was that they would obey his voice. They would keep his law, statutes, and judgments. Verse 8, And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. This is the ratification. Or this is the acceptance. And then later, blood was sprinkled upon the people to ratify the covenant. God gave the covenant, the terms of it, Obey my voice. The people said, All that the Lord says will do it. So it was accepted by the people. But nowhere in this covenant did God institute animal sacrifices. Nowhere. You can read in there, it simply said, obey my voice. God never once gave animal sacrifices as a part of the old covenant. These were added later. And that's what Paul was referring to when he said, what that was, which was added later. And that most people say, see there, that's the law that was added the Old Covenant. And so they try to do away with all of God's law. No, it was the sacrifices that were added later because the people couldn't keep this covenant. They violated the agreement, or they violated the covenant. As proof, I want to go to Jeremiah 7, verse 22 and 24, to prove that the sacrifices were never a part of the Old Covenant and that God spoke them later. And he confirms this through the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 7, verse 22 to 24. This is the King James Version. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I'll be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk you in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. But they hearken or listen not, nor incline their ear, but walk in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. This is why God had to add the sacrifices, because they walked backward. They would not keep the laws of God. They wouldn't keep his statutes, his judgments. And therefore, it became sin because God's law is what sin, what determines what sin is. 1 John 3, 4, transgression of the law is sin. So when they turned back and would not keep the laws of God, God added the sacrificial laws later. But it was not a part of the new covenant. It was never a part. And that's something we have to understand. So in the New Testament, when the Apostle Paul or when various writers say, that the sacrifices and the oblations, the law, was no longer in force in various things. It's talking about the ritualistic laws that Christ or God added later, the sacrifices to point the people to Jesus Christ, the Passover, the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And that's all the sacrifices were for. Now, Leviticus 23 is the only list of the annual holy days in one single chapter in the entire Bible. Once God had established a Levitical priesthood in Israel, and then he later added the sacrifices, the holy days were kept continuously. But the holy days were not determined 
of the animal sacrifices. It's just that the animal sacrifices were required because the people went backward. They were sinning, and they were looking forward at every time they came together in a holy assembly to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ when they would no longer be sinners but would be cleansed from their sins. So without the promise of the Holy Spirit and the spiritual promises of the New Covenant, the Old Covenant Israelites could not keep God's ways. They just couldn't do it. And let's look at the world today. You and I were not keeping God's ways until he opened our mind to allow us to understand spiritual things. With God's Holy Spirit, we can understand them. Without God's Holy Spirit, we were going our own way and we would justify every action we made not to keep the ways of God. Self-justification. Because Romans 8, verse 7 and 8 clearly says the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God. The people back there, their carnal mind was not subject to the law of God. Deuteronomy 5, 29 verifies that. That they did not have a heart to obey God. And God wished they did. That's why he prophesied of a new covenant where he would put the proper type of heart in them. But the holy days were rediscovered by ancient Israel ever so often, never by the ten lost tribes. After the division of the house of Israel, the ten northern tribes, and the two southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin, Israel never reinstituted the holy days, never once. Read it through First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. The house of Israel never reinstituted the holy days. That's why they went into national captivity. They were dispersed among all nations. They became isolated from the promises of God because they don't even know who they are. They think they're Gentiles because they lost all track of God's ways, his laws, statutes, and judgments. And yet, every so often, in the house of Judah, a righteous king would come along, go into the temple, dust off the books of the law, and start reading them. And when he read the books of the law, he discovered the holy days. And they would reinstitute the holy days, and there would be a spiritual revival in Israel. And when they, another king came along that was wicked, they wouldn't keep the holy days. And suddenly, the plan of God was out of their mind. They had no desire to obey God. But ancient Israel did keep the holy days only on occasions. It was not a continuous thing. But they went backward, and they didn't have the heart to keep them. But now, let's look and see if Jesus, the Savior, who was actually the one who spoke at Mount Sinai and gave the law of God, and later gave the entire covenant in which Moses wrote down in the book. Let's look and see if he kept the holy days. So Jesus' parents every year went up to Jerusalem about the time of the Passover and the season for the days of unleavened bread. That's found in Luke 2. Luke 2, verse 41. Luke 2, verse 41. Now his parents, referring to Jesus, went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Then verse 43, and when they had fulfilled the days, plural, days, and yet if you look back in Leviticus 23, the Passover is one day. But what happens immediately after Passover? There are seven days of unleavened bread. Seven. That's why it says that when they had fulfilled the days, plural, they kept the Passover and the seven days of unleavened bread. As they returned, the child Jesus tarried or stayed behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother didn't realize it. And so he was left behind. But the point I'm making is they did go up. They did keep the days of unleavened bread. They kept the Passover. And this is the very first recorded recording in the scriptures that Jesus kept the holy days. And this was when he was 12 years of age. But John 2, verses 13 through 23, also testify that Jesus went up to Jerusalem at the Passover in the days of unleavened bread. This is after his ministry had started. That's John 2, verse 13 to 23. If anybody wants to make note of that. We won't read it at this time. But after his ministry started, he went up to Jerusalem in verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And then verse 23, now when he was at Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day. That's the first day of unleavened bread because the Passover was not a feast day. So Jesus did keep the Passover and the days of unleavened bread. The Feast of Tabernacles was to be kept in the fall of the year. 
and it was for seven days, and it was to be followed by an eighth day that we refer to as the last great day. And Jesus kept it, and it's recorded in John the seventh chapter, verse thirty seven to thirty nine. John seven, verse thirty seven. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Now why would he preach that particular topic? Because if our understanding is correct, the whole world is going to be resurrected. All those who have never accepted Jesus Christ on that last great day and salvation, the truth of God, will be offered to them. And that's why he said, if you want to know the truth and you're thirsting for truth and you want eternal life, come to me and drink. I'm the source. He that believes on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, God's Holy Spirit. See, ancient Israel had never received God's Spirit, and the Jews of that day had not received God's Holy Spirit either. And that's why this was such a mystery to them. He was offering the Holy Spirit so they could start on their road towards salvation. And it says, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. That's future. Should receive. They hadn't received it yet. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. But once he was crucified and went to his Father, and on the day of Pentecost, then the Holy Spirit was given. But many scriptures could be shown to re that, that would refer to the time when Jesus kept the holy days, and that they were actually designed from the beginning, all the way back in Genesis 1, verse 14. Because the sun and moon has not changed. God set them in their orbits, and they've been orbiting ever since. And the cycles have been there all the time. So did God intend the holy days from the beginning? I believe he did. Otherwise, why would he have designed the world and the universe the way he did, the sun and the moon? At least that's the indication I get. And since Abraham did keep the statutes, the only place I find statutes is in the law of God, where it talks of the holy days. Now, did the apostles and the disciples of Jesus Christ after the day of Pentecost keep the holy days? I think it's very interesting. And I think we should look at it and understand whether they really did or not. And the disciples of Jesus wanted to know. In Acts, the first chapter, when he would establish his kingdom. They were looking for a Messiah that would come on the scene and overthrow the Roman government and lead Israel to the greatest heights in its history. They were to dominate and rule the world. All the prophets prophesied of a world government. And someone from the tribe of Judah would come on the scene to lead it. In verse, um, verses 1 through 8 is where this is all spoken about. But verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Acts 1, verse 6. Then in verse 7, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power. And the actual Greek translation should be the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon you. That's how it should read. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So he told them to stay there until they received power. And they were to receive it in Jerusalem. And that power came on the day of Pentecost, Acts the second chapter. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. This was the disciples. They're in Jerusalem participating in one of the holy days of God. And what happened? The Holy Spirit came upon them. And it was a supernatural manifestation at this particular time to kick off the New Testament church. It was a miraculous starting of the New Testament church to prove to those people who had seen all the signs and the miracles that Jesus had done that this was of God, that this truly was from the Holy Spirit of God. But that power came on the day of Pentecost, one of the holy days of Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, in the form of the Holy Spirit. And these spirit-filled Christians, or followers of Jesus Christ, were considered just another sect of the Jews. 
That's all they were considered, just another sect of the Jews because they continued to keep the Sabbath day and the annual holy days of Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. And this is shown in Acts chapter 28, verse 22. They were considered nothing more than just another sect of the Jews. They were no different, except they had God's Holy Spirit, they accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and they were looking for a new covenant with better promises than the old. Verse 22 of Acts 28. But we desire... Here was Paul in prison, and he stayed in his own hired house two years in prison in Rome. We desire, these are Jews, to hear of you what you think. For as concerning this sect, just another sect of the Jews, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So the Jewish people in Rome heard that this sect of Judaism was spoken against. So God's holy days weren't done away. The apostles didn't do away with them. To be exact, even in pagan Rome, the Jews who were there knew that they continued to keep the holy days and the Sabbath because it was spoken against by the Orthodox Jews who did not receive God's Holy Spirit. Then in verse 23, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him and to his lodging, to whom he testified and expounded the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. So he taught directly from the Old Testament. So how could it be abolished and done away? But to be exact, there were other sects also. There was a sect of the Sadducees, as found in Acts 5. So the Christians were just considered as one sect of Judaism. But there were Sadducees in Acts 5, verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees. So you see, these various sects are just like we would say different denominations of Christianity today. There may be three or four hundred different sects of Christianity. That's the way it was then. Christianity was nothing more than a sect of the Jews, absolutely proving that they were not canceling or doing away with any of God's law. There was also the sect of the Pharisees. Acts 15, verse 5, the sect of the Pharisees. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Here were certain people who were trying to bring about the legalistic portion of the, of the old covenant, which the new covenant actually modified. See, circumcision in the Old Testament was a cutting away of the foreskin of every male. But in the New Testament, every person, male or female, had to be circumcised in heart. The cutting away of the hostility or the enmity against God's law. That was the circumcision of the New Testament. And we don't need to be circumcised physically that way. So there were various branches, various sects of Christianity. But none of them was doing away with God's holy days. And that's, that's a problem for those who want to do away with them, but they haven't dissected the scriptures and looked to see that Christianity was just another sect of the Jews. But Jesus knew better. To be exact, he stated that he didn't come to do away with the law and the prophets. And every one of us, I think, know that scripture, Matthew 5, 17 to 19. He did not come to do away with the law and the prophets, but he came to fulfill them or to fill them to the brim, to fill them full. He came to set us an example, to show us to be exact, it was even prophesied of Jesus Christ that he would come and magnify the law and make it honorable. That's Isaiah 42, verse 21. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. That's a prophecy of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ came and magnified it in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And actually, all the way through his life, he magnified nine of the Ten Commandments in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and then he magnified the Sabbath by setting the example of the way he kept it, and even the holy days also, by the way he kept it, taking away the commandments of men that had been added to it and kept it in the proper spirit and intent in which God gave it to be observed from the beginning. 
So while there is, and I admit this, a great deal of silence in references to the laws, the statutes, and the judgments in the New Testament writings, there is silence in many places. There is sufficient evidence that the New Testament Christians continue to keep the Holy Days, as well as the Ten Commandment law, as well as the eating laws pertaining to clean and unclean meats. The Apostle Peter himself, after seeing the vision, he said, Never have I eaten anything of a sheep coming down three times, and then he went to Cornelius' house, and then the vision meant that he was not to call any man common or unclean. It didn't give him the right to eat unclean food. It just told him that he wasn't to call any man common or unclean. And he said, Never have any, has anything unclean gone into my mouth. He had never eaten anything unclean, even after receiving that vision. And so God's laws are there. And there was a conference of the apostles and the leading and the leading members of the church to be exact, even all the church in Jerusalem was present. And this is in Acts, the 15th chapter. And this was concerning the unique problems of the Gentiles after they had been converted as New Testament Christians. Remember, they needed to learn the proper ways of God. The Gentiles had only known the rudiments of this world, paganism. They didn't know about God's laws. So they, many of them, Paul would go into a city and preach to them. They would be converted to Jesus Christ, but they didn't know all the law. They didn't know all the prophets. They didn't know how to live properly. They were Gentiles. They'd never known the law before in its codified form, and they didn't have synagogues to go to. But after much discussion and much disputing, Throughout this chapter of the various ministers there and of the lay members, the Apostle James stood up right in their midst and he summed up their entire discussion. He said, all right, brethren, I'm trying to find the exact verse. But anyway, he stood up, verses 19 and 20. He said, my sentence is, or my observation, my uh, judgment is, after listening to what everybody had to say, was that the Gentiles should abstain from idols, meats and different things offered to idols, because, say in Corinth, for instance, they actually had temple prostitutes in their pagan temples where men would go into them, and they would actually participate in sexual exercises as worship to their God and to their idols. So God said abstain, and their judgment was to abstain from the pollutions of idols. Pollutions doesn't just mean meats offered to idols, but it, it means any pollution in which people worshipped idols. It said to abstain from fornication, which was also a part of their temple exercises and the temple prostitutes. Things strangled, this is animals, they would actually strangle animals and eat it with the blood inside it. And God said, no, don't eat blood. And they were to abstain from, thing, from blood because the life is in the blood. This is in verse 19 and verse 20. But notice what James did. He did say, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now look at this, verse 21. This is in this chapter dealing with Gentile converts. Now, as far as the Jews were concerned, Christians were just another sect of Judaism. But they thought they had gone off and were in idolatry by worshiping the Son of God, Jesus Christ. But look what he said. For Moses of old time have in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. What does that mean? Here, the apostles of the founding New Testament church were telling Gentiles to go into the synagogues on the Sabbath day and they could hear the law of God read and preached. The key was there were a few things that they were concerned about in their worship to God. And that was, don't participate in idol worship anymore. And the temple prostitutes don't have anything to do with that. Go into the synagogues, which is the Sabbath day, and listen to the priest, the Levitical priesthood, read the books of the law, and then you'll learn God's laws. This was the instructions the apostles and the ministers were to take back to the Gentile churches. Does this sound like they were doing away with all of God's laws or God's holy days when they were actually instructed to go into the temple with people who did not have God's Holy Spirit and hear the books of the law read so they could grasp 
an understanding of God's true way of life. This is, to me, most amazing that most people never consider, and yet there it is, inspired for our learning. And to me, it tells me that God's laws and God's ways were not done away at all, and they weren't nailed to the cross, as most Protestant teachers say. But the New Testament apostles actually instructed the, Jew, the Gentiles to go into the synagogues. And these were the synagogues of people who had rejected Christ and yet were still teaching the laws that came from God. They weren't the Jews' laws. They were God's laws. It was just that the Jews did not have God's Holy Spirit, so they couldn't keep a spiritual law. But now here is a New Testament convert. Even though he's a Gentile, he can go in and even from an unconverted person could hear the law of God read, and because he had God's Holy Spirit, he could spiritually discern God's Word and learn and obey God's laws. They were told that Moses was read in all these cities. So look at the prophecy now of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, verse 33 and 34. Jeremiah 31, verse 33 and 34. But this shall be the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Notice what he does say. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. That doesn't sound like he's going to do away with his law. This is why the New Testament apostles could tell Gentile converts to go in to an unconverted people, but they were reading the true laws of God and they could spiritually discern them because God would be writing his laws into their hearts because they had God's Holy Spirit now. Even though the Jewish people there got nothing out of it spiritually, they could because they were having God's laws written into their heart. And he said, And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So God's law was to be the fundamental foundation of the new covenant. It was not to be nailed to the cross, as most teach today, in which someone just told me yesterday. And this is reaffirmed, and we can look at it in the New Testament in Acts, the seventh chapter. Acts, the seventh chapter, <clears throat> verse 37 and verse 38. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Jesus Christ was in the church in the wilderness. He was the one that was actually leading Israel. He's the one that gave them the laws. But he said they couldn't keep them. And he said, oh, I wish there was a heart in them in Deuteronomy 5.29. So they could keep them. But look what he said. This is he, verse 38, that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai. So Jesus Christ spoke to Moses in Mount Sinai. Who, the Israelites and Moses, our forefathers, received the lively oracles to give unto us, New Testament Christians. They were giving them to us, spiritual Israel. They received them, but they didn't have God's Holy Spirit, so they couldn't understand spiritual things. So the New Covenant was to write God's laws in our hearts and our minds. It was not to do away with them. And so it is with the Holy Days. They are a part of... They are statutes which were to be forever. Abraham kept those statutes even before there was any such thing as a Levitical priesthood and before there was any such thing as an organized sacrificial system in Israel. But now, there was a problem, and we recognize that problem in the Old Covenant. We do know there was a problem. So I think what we should do is go back and see what the problem is how it's going to be resolved, and then we can understand that there's nothing wrong with what God has given if we understand where the problem came from. So now Hebrews chapter 8 tells us very clearly what the problem was and how God would resolve it. Hebrews 8 
verses 8. Well, let's go back to verse 6. But now hath he, Jesus Christ, obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, so it was not faultless. There was something wrong with that first covenant. But let's see what it was. Then should no place have been sought for the second. If the first covenant had had nothing wrong with it whatsoever, there would never have been a reason to establish a second covenant. But now, verse 8 tells us clearly what was wrong with the first covenant. For finding fault with them, the people, not the laws, God says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. So it was nothing wrong with the laws, nothing wrong with the statutes or judgments. What was wrong was with the people. They didn't have a heart to obey them. Their spiritual laws and they didn't have God's Holy Spirit we're physical and we're carnal. And Romans 8 verse 7 clearly says that the carnal mind is hostile. It's enmity to God's law. So in verse 10, God says, For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. I'll be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. This is a clarification or a fulfillment of of what had already happened, or, or, or Jeremiah in chapter 31, verse 31 to 33, had already stated that this new covenant would be written in their hearts. And that's why New Testament converts from, Gentile, from out of a Gentile society, paganism, could go into the synagogues where there were unconverted Jews, and yet they were reading the law and they could still learn because they could spiritually comprehend, even though the Jews couldn't. So the Apostle Paul knew that the feast were to be kept, but with a new understanding. He wrote a letter to the Corinthians, a very corrective letter to the Corinthians during the days of unleavened bread. And notice his statement to, the, to these particular Gentile converts at Corinth. And he says in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5, and this is a very corrective letter, and it's very strong, because these were Gentile converts who were trying to come out of paganism and start keeping the proper laws of God. Okay, he says in verse 7, Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, the old sinful ways, that you may be a new lump. Now, if they weren't keeping the days of unleavened bread, how would they, coming out of paganism, how would they have understood what he was talking about? Get rid of leaven and be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is slain or is sacrificed for us. Therefore, because Jesus Christ has already been slain for us, he's forgiven our sins, let us keep the feast. And the word the feast actually should be translated holy day. Let us keep the holy day. And it's talking about the holy day of unleavened bread. He's already used the word Old leaven and lump, and we're to become unleavened. And the only place that's found is Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, where it's a statute to be kept forever. And we are spiritual Israel. All the covenants pertain to Israel. We're to purge out. We're to keep the feast. Purge out leaven. So it is because Jesus died for us and he forgave us of all of our sins that we're to now keep the days of unleavened bread. Because you see, the Passover was at the very beginning of the days, of all of God's holy days. To be exact, how could we even know what the holy days mean until Jesus Christ was, had died for us? See, the Passover came first. Now, if you can do away with the holy days of God, shouldn't the holy days have come first and the Passover last so that when Christ was killed, everything preceding that could have ceased? Rather, the Passover is first. Christ was slain to forgive us of our sins and suddenly the New Testament era came into being. So how can we do away with anything? It seems to me that it would be kept afterward and the understanding would only come afterward. Afterward. 
if G- after Jesus Christ had already become our Passover lamb. So Paul even gave instructions of how New Covenant Christians should keep the holy days. And this was right here in verse 8. He says, don't keep it with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. No, get rid of carnality that you had before the Spirit of God came into you. But here's how we're to keep the holy days in the New Covenant. But with unleavened, this is an attitude of sincerity and truth. We're to unleaven our bodies from all malice, evil, and sin, and the carnal nature, and we're to go in with a new attitude, a new approach of sincerity and the truth of God. So our carnal mind was to be cut out or circumcised out of us so that now we could keep God's holy days with a new heart and a new approach and a new attitude. But Paul understood this concept. He did, and that's why he made the statement in Acts chapter 18, verse 21. And I think we need to look at that. Acts chapter 18, verse 21. He made the following statement. He bade them farewell. He was at a particular city, and he told them by, and he was with friends, and he told them by, Priscilla and Aquila and the others at the city of Ephesus. And he bade them farewell, saying, I, the Apostle Paul, must by all means keep this feast that comes in Jerusalem. He wanted to go up to the Feast of Tabernacles, apparently in Jerusalem. But I'll return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. He went because he knew that God's laws, his statutes, and his judgments have never changed. To be exact, even the holy days were indicated by the setting up of the moon and the sun in proper conjunction all the way back in Genesis, the first chapter in verse 14. And so Paul is the very one that most ministers use to twist his writings and to say that the plan of God, his laws, his statutes, his judgments, including his holy days and the Sabbath day and the laws of clean and unclean meats have been done away. They use his writings. But I think we should, we should lay a groundwork first in 2 Peter. 2 Peter. The Apostle Peter recognized, even back in his day, that they were already twisting Paul's writings. And they were perverting the truth of God all the way back in his day while he was still alive. So in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, Peter writes this about Paul. And I count that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Verse 16, As also in all his, or Paul's, epistles, speaking them, them of these things, referring to God's laws and so on, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, or they twist, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Paul clearly says that people who were coming into Christianity were being taught probably by Judaizers who had not received God's Holy Spirit. These New Testament uh, Christians who were coming out of paganism were accepting God's laws, God's holy days, and so as a direct result, Paul's writings were twisted by these people and there are many of them were trying to give grace only and not the keeping of God's laws. So Paul wrote a very powerful letter to Gentile converts at Colossae concerning paganism. So I want to turn to it in Colossians, the second chapter. But he, he wrote to them concerning philosophy and vain deceit, the tradition of men, and the rudiments of the world. And they were to come out from the paganized world in which they had been brought up. Because now they were to follow Jesus Christ. And he was told, or Jesus Christ was the very God that gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. He also spoke to Moses and gave him chapter 23 of Leviticus concerning the holy days. And he spoke concerning his Sabbath at that same period of time. 
So Paul did understand that God's laws and his holy days were all here. And he also understood that Jesus did not come to abolish his ways, but he came to set us, all mankind, and especially Gentiles who had never approached the law of God, set us free from the paganized society, the rudiments of the world, vain philosophies, vain deceit. These are the things that he came to lead us away from. So this is why Paul wrote to the Colossians. He, he said in verse 8, Not to let anyone spoil you. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. This is what he was wanting to bring them away from. He said, or, notice down in verse 16, he did not want any man, let no man therefore judge you. These are Gentile converts, people who had never known the laws of God before, but now they were taught the true laws of God. And he said, don't let anybody judge you in meat or in drink or in respect. And the actual Greek translation, instead of respect, it should be in part. In your Gentile convert taking part of a holy day or of the new moon. And why would he mention new moon? Unless they were determining the holy days by looking for the new moon. And that's the way you determine them. Or of the Sabbath. Here they all were connected together, the Sabbath day, the holy days and taking part in your eating and drinking on those holy days as a festival. And you determine them by the new moon, all lumped together. And he said, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And the word is is in italics and it shouldn't be there. The body of Christ is who judges these matters, not Gentile pagan People who want to bring you back into their days, months, years, and their rudiments of the world, their philosophy and vain deceits and traditions of men. And see, and that's the way it is. When we come out of those and we start keeping God's festivals, God's holy days, God's Sabbath, we start observing the new moon to look at it and know when a new month starts so that we can determine when the festivals are going to be People want to drag us back into the rudiments of the world. Pagan holidays with a dressed up name on it called Christian. But notice what it says, verse 17. These things, these holy days are a shadow of things to come. This is yet future. Years after Jesus Christ was crucified. Now why would the Apostle Paul state that the holy days were yet the fulfillment of them, and they're a shadow of things to come if Christ severed them and completed them at the cross. Christ was the Passover. All the holy days came after the Passover. To me, it's only logical that once Jesus Christ became our Passover lamb, then the fulfillment of the holy days would only occur after he became that sacrifice. How could he have fulfilled all the holy days? on the Passover when they didn't even occur till after he, was, he has died in God's plan. It says here, these holy days are a sh and the Sabbath is a shadow of things to come. And even those who keep God's Sabbath day admit that it points to the 1,000 year reign when Jesus will rule the earth in the millennium. They don't do away with the Sabbath when Christ came and died on the cross. So why do away with the holy days? Because they came after the Passover, not before it. So how could he have already completed it and fulfilled it and done away with it when the Apostle Paul, years later, after the cross, had already come and gone, he said that these holy days are a shadow of things to come, yet future. So how could we cease to keep them if they are yet portraying things to come? We've never quit keeping the Sabbath because it betrays the millennium yet to come. So why should we keep quit keeping the holy days? It's only because people do not want to obey God from the heart. They don't want to. Men have a tendency to have religion on the surface, and the Apostle Paul clearly states that. Then in verse 20, 
or in verse 21, 20 and 21, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, see, we don't have to follow paganized religious ceremonies anymore. We're following the statutes and the judgments and the laws of God. If we're dead from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? These aren't God's laws and ordinances. These are the world's, the pagan eyes that these Colossians were coming out of. Touch not, taste not, handle not. That was all a part of the philosophy of that day. Which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men. And yet the holy days are statutes of God to be observed in every generation forever. So brethren, look at verse 23, what these worldly ordinances produce in people. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship. So we're keeping God's holy days. They are spiritually discerned. They produce or project forward God's plan, ever unfolding plan of salvation. We understand because we have God's Holy Spirit. But those who are still in a paganized society, following the rudiments of the world, the holidays of the world, which are not based upon God's ways, they, are show, they have a show of wisdom. But they're not real. It's a false. It's only a show. And notice what it says. It's a part of will worship. Not the worship of God. They're worshiping according to their own will. And humility and neglecting. See, it's only a show of wisdom, a show of humility. But it's a false humility. And it's a show. That's all it is. Neglecting of the body. Neglecting of Christ. Neglecting God. And notice the word neglecting. If you want a proper translation, look up the Greek word. It means punishing of the body. And they did. They were called ascetics and stoics. They would actually flagellate the body and many times in worshiping according to their own ways. So it is not in any honor of God, but it's only honoring their own flesh and satisfying their own flesh, thinking they're satisfying God when they're not, because they've broken God's laws, statutes, and judgments. But what about the millennium? Will God's ways be kept? in the millennium, and we'll bring it to a close for today. <clears throat> According to Genesis 1, verse 14, the sun and the moon were fixed in the heavens so as to determine the holy days. Why would God plan such a thing from the beginning if, it were not, if he had not intended mankind to continually keep the feast days as long as there was an earth and as long as there were human beings? We saw in Leviticus 23, verse 14 and verse 21, where the statutes were to be forever in every generation. So why would God state that Abraham kept his laws and his statutes, which are the holy days, as a part of the statutes, and judgments, if he really didn't? I believe he did. He wouldn't because God doesn't lie. The scripture says so. God does not lie or bear false witness, so he would not record in the Holy Scriptures that Abraham kept those statutes unless he actually did. And why would God instruct ancient Israel to keep the festivals if they weren't important? And why, above all things, would the Apostle Paul instruct Gentile converts to keep them, right here in Colossians 2.16 and 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, if they were in reality nailed to the cross? when Jesus' body was nailed to it. Above all, why would God prophesy that he would require the nations to keep the festival of tabernacles during the 1,000-year reign of Christ on the earth if the festivals were not important for Christians today? Why would he require something of Israel? Why would he require something in the millennium? Why would Abraham it would be recorded that he kept them if they weren't important for us. And why would Paul state they were shadows of yet future things and we should not let anyone else judge us in our participation in them if they weren't important? Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14 clearly shows the in the millennium 
Jesus Christ is going to require a representative of every family of the nations of the earth to come up to Jerusalem to worship during the period of time of the Holy Days, the Feast of Tabernacles. Chapter 14, verse 1 talks about the day of the Lord when Jesus Christ will intervene. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, verse 4. Verse 9, he will have totally solidified his position as world ruler. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. And then on down in verse 16. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Jesus Christ will punish them by withholding the rain so that the crops will not grow till they learn that he is Lord and he is to be worshipped and they'll come up to worship him. And in verse 18, And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not but have no rain, there shall be the, this is the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that will not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This is going to happen because in that day there will be holiness unto the Lord. We are going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles in the millennium. So I think that we need to preach the Feast of Tabernacles. We need to preach all of God's holy days. And we need to get back to them in a very strong way. And I hope to present part two and part three on this subject and then go into the calendar, the Jewish calendar, is it the proper calendar for us to keep, or have we been observing the holy days a day, two days, or possibly three days off? We'll see.